If all goes well this week, the James Webb Telescope will launch from Europe spaceport in French Guiana on board an Ariane 5 rocket. And with that in mind, we're talking to Mark McCorkran of the European Space Agency to get the inside scoop of what we can expect from this incredible spacecraft. As always, please do get involved with us on our social networks. We're at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Yep, we love hearing from you. But right now, please enjoy episode 68 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles and welcome to episode 68. Now, this show we recorded at the start of December, knowing that the launch date of the James Webb Space Telescope is planned for 22nd of December and knowing that I was going to be away again. Again? Where are you at this time? I'm actually, well... All, if all goes well, I'm actually going to be in your country. Yeah, um, I, I should be in New York, but everything seems to be very up in the air at the moment as to the point we're recording this. All right. Well, that's pretty That's pretty awesome. Let's hope you get yeah. there. That's pretty cool. Yeah. A- enough of that. Enough of that chit chat. Let's, uh, let's crack on. Yes. All right. You are go for TLI. Over. I understand. We're going for TLI. So, hopefully, weather permitting and any other technical mishaps uh, permitting, (laughs) we're going to have a big launch this week. The James Webb Space Telescope is finally going to space. For those of you who don't know what that is, the European Space Agency website says, The James Webb Space Telescope, or Webb, is the next great space science observatory following Hubble, designed to answer outstanding questions about the universe and to make breakthrough discoveries in all fields of astronomy. Webb will see further into our origins from the formation of stars and planets to the birth of the first galaxies in the early universe. Webb is an international partnership between NASA, ESA, and the CSA, which is the Canadian Space Agency. The telescope will launch on an Ariane 5 rocket from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. And so we got in contact with the European Space Agency to see if there was anyone we could talk to about this mission, and they put us in touch with Mark McCorkran, who is an interdisciplinary scientist for this mission. He is also the Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration at the European Space Agency and co-founder of Space Rocks, which celebrates space exploration and the art, music and culture it inspires through public events and more. So let's get on with the interview. Hi, Mark. Thank you very much for joining us to talk to us about this fantastic new telescope. So can you start by giving us the historical background of how this came to be and how you got involved with it? Well, thanks very much to both of you for welcoming on first first off. Um, and, and I presume this podcast is about six hours long because that's going to be how long it takes me to tell the story <laughs> of the project now known as JWST. Um, well, the short version is that even before Hubble was launched in 1990, um, people were aware that there would be things that it couldn't see. Um, it, it has seen amazing things, of course, the Hubble Space Telescope, but what couldn't it see? And in principle, one of the things you could figure out that it wouldn't be able to see is the first galaxies that ever formed after the Big Bang. And the fundamental reason for that is redshift. So the universe is expanding and the most distant galaxies are um, the, the furthest away from us, but also because light has travelled over those nearly 13 and a half billion years, it's been redshifted that that light is out of the visible and it's in the infrared. So people began to say, well, all right, you know, Hubble's about to launch. This is 1989. What do we need? What do we need to start planning to extend beyond that science um, in high redshift galaxies? And these are, you know, this is times when I had just... 1989. So I just finished being a PhD student uh, a year before. And during my PhD, the redshift of the most distant objects that were being dis- uh, had been discovered had kind of crawled up to redshift of three uh, during my PhD. 
and were getting a little, you know, Redshift 4 by the beginning of the 90s. The sorts of things we're talking about now, Redshift 10, uh, Redshift 11, Redshift 12, and those are the sorts of things that the, the thing then called the Next Generation Space Telescope was designed to detect. One of the things. There are many other things which we'll talk about in, in, the, in the podcast, but that was the starting point of why people said, let's build a powerful infrared observatory as early as I say, as 1989. Wow. If you kind of leap forward from that, there were all sorts of ideas. Could that be a telescope on the moon? Could that be a telescope uh, at the where it is now, the L2 point? And you would say, well, why? why? I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope is close to the Earth. What's wrong with that? In fact, it's been useful for Hubble because we've been able to go and service it uh, a number of times and change instruments and, of course, fix the optics uh, that were broken when it was first launched. But the thing about an infrared telescope is that if you want to detect extremely faint uh, photons coming from very distant objects in the infrared, the last thing you want is a warm telescope because that telescope is then going to be emitting in the infrared itself. But, you know, we see each other across electronics here, but it, everything around the room here is emitting um, infrared light at around 10 microns. Um, it's around 300 Kelvin, um, so room temperature. Uh, and even shortward of that, at uh, 3 microns, 5 microns, there's a lot of radiation in this room, or light, let's call it. But you don't want that coming from a telescope if you want to detect faint things. So you've got to cool the telescope down. And putting that next to Earth is a very bad idea because the Earth's a big, hot thing that will warm the telescope up. In fact, it's a little-known fact about Hubble that Hubble is actually warmed internally with heaters to room temperature. Um, and, and the reason for that is to keep the mirror in the same shape as it was polished um, at room temperature. And, of course, wow. the ultimate irony is it was polished into the wrong shape. So uh, <laughs> keeping the heaters on just keeps it in the wrong shape. It, it, it wouldn't improve if you cooled it down, but uh, so uh, that, that, that's, not, that's not helpful. So that's why you talk about the far side of the moon or um, this L2 point where you can keep the sun and the earth on the same side of the observatory behind this enormous sun shield we're going to talk about and the telescope on the other side can then just cool into space it can radiate into the darkness of space um, and get down to what we need which is 40 kelvin minus 233 degrees celsius uh, so that was kind of the you know the realization that we needed to do that um, early 90s the design began to converge on a big telescope because these galaxies are going to be faint you need to collect lots of light a cold telescope, um, which need, means you need an open telescope, not one in a tube. You want it to be open into space so that it can radiate the heat away. And that means you need this giant sun shield. So that design sort of came together in the um, uh, mid-90s or so. And then there was this lovely moment where the administrator of NASA, Dan Goldin, said, you know, you astronomers designing a four-metre telescope to go into space to do this science. You're not being ambitious enough. You need to build an eight-metre telescope. Uh, because I, I I work in the black, you know, uh, in the in the uh, you know the military side of things, and I know it can be done. And everybody's going, what? Huh? What, what, what telescopes in space? That's eight meters already. Uh, it'd be, you know, it'd be pretty hard to stealth. You'd you'd, you'd know about it somehow. Um, and then through a lot, you know, the European Space Agency got involved around that time, mid nineties. The Canadian Space Agency. I got involved in nineteen ninety eight. Um, on the European Science Study Team, which was then proposing to ESA that we would fund an ESA participation in the mission alongside NASA and the CSA. And then I became, I was on lots of working groups and committees, stayed on that, and then became a member of what is now called the James Webb Space Telescope Science Working Group. And that started in 2002, and so we've all been involved a long time. And then there was kind of a crunch where we realised that an 8-metre telescope was going to be too much, um, too many segments, too much mass. So it was scaled down to the thing we know today, six and a half meters. Um, there's kind of a line drawn in the sand there. It has to do with the resolution of a telescope, the sensitivity of the telescope. We said we couldn't go back to a four meter, which is a bit ironic since we started off saying that a four meter was fine, but you know. Um, so that's <laughs> when the thing started in the early 2000s and, and to where we are now. We can talk about all the stuff in between uh, as we go through. So the thing that listeners may be aware of most about the James Webb Space Telescope is the the kind of honeycomb looking uh, thing. Is that is that the sun shield or is that something completely different? Well, that's, that's the other side. So you've got sort of two main things visually that you would see. Uh, one is this giant sun shield, which is sort of somewhere between the size of a tennis court and a basketball court. It's not square, it's kind of diamond shaped. Um, uh, that's the sort of big metal um, it looks metal, but it's actually very thin, metal-coated uh, plastic film. 
Um, the other side, this big hexagonal structure you're talking about, is the telescope. That's the thing that collects the light. Right. Um, and, and, and again, because we wanted a telescope that's very big, uh, that gives us two things. It gives us the sensitivity, and it lets us detect lots and lots of photons, so we can see these very faint objects. But it also gives us more resolution. The bigger a telescope, the finer the detail you can see uh, in space. Um, so we, we, we kind of knew that we needed more resolution than Hubble could deliver in the infrared. Um, uh, we, so we, you'll have pictures about as sharp as Hubble, actually. They won't be sharper because the wavelength is roughly three or four times longer. Telescope's three times bigger. So it'll all, it'll all equal out. The resolution will be the same as Hubble in the visible. But then you've got to package it somehow. Um, you know, you could build a six and a half meter mirror. We've done that on the ground. Such things exist. Uh, monolithic mirrors. Uh, there's one, uh, there's a couple in, in South America, the Magellan Telescope, and there's one in Arizona, um, what used to be called uh, the, 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 the MMT, the Multi-Mirror Telescope, when it was lots and lots of mirrors, but it's now one six-meter telescope. But you can't fit that in a rocket fairing, right? So the ro rocket fairings aren't wide enough, so you've got to fold the telescope up. So the way to do that is to make it segmented, that it can actually fold, um, and if you think about it, the telescope has got these 18 hexagonal segments, and it doesn't all sort of package up into one. It folds along kind of the lines of a dining room table. You sort of fold the wings down. Um, and then vertically, it's still six and a half metres vertical, but it's much less wide, so it can fit in the rocket fairing. Um, and the other thing you need is to make it light. Fascinating sort of little factoid about James Webb is that it's much bigger than Hubble, but it only weighs half the weight. Uh, Hubble's wow. 12 and a half tons and JWST six and a half tons. Uh, and, and that's all been done by sort of massive, clever technology development and engineering. And the thing about those mirrors is they're actually made of beryllium. Um, beryllium's a really lightweight metal. Uh, it's an absolute nightmare to work with because it's poisonous. Uh, it's deadly, po deadly poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of the facilities that made the mirrors more than 10 years ago now, uh, you know, basically that was it. That's all you could do with them. You could throw them away after that because they're just completely filled with beryllium dust. Um, and then that very, that, that final bit, <clears throat> well, actually I should say that these mirrors, you know, they're meter, 1.2 meters across, but on the back, they actually have a honeycomb structure, as you said, um, for the, not from the front now, much smaller, um, that's all been hollowed out on the back to make these mirrors incredibly lightweight, but very stiff. Um, and then you have this tiny layer of gold on the front to reflect all the infrared light. You would think, well, why isn't it silver? Why isn't it shiny? Why, you know, because in the infrared, gold is a much better reflector. Uh, so in, in, if you were a snake and you could see in the infrared, that telescope would look shiny white. Um, but we're not. We, we're humans, so we see gold as a, as a, a coloured thing because we're not looking in the infrared. That is amazing. Okay, that's really fascinating. So I have a question. Um, so you've kind of already talked about this, but I was not aware that um, the, the James Webb Space Telescope was being developed over or being discussed over 30 years ago as the new generation ta space telescope. Ah, the, well, you have to be even even, have to be even more tricky than that. It's next generation. It was all it, that. It's named for that next generation. Yeah, Star Trek <laughs> Next Generation. There were so many things called Next Generation back in the eighties. It was very influential. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Um, how do you? I mean, how do you personally feel? You know, you're, you've obviously been you know attached to this project for a pretty long time. How do you? How do you feel seeing it? You know, go from you know drawing board to you know being built to you know in a few months it'll be at L two. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you must be very emotional. You've seen the telescope for the first time. I saw it a couple of weeks ago for the first time in French Guiana, uh, fully built. Um, I suppose in some ways we've built a bit of a thick shell around us. You know, we've been through ups and downs. The telescope was supposed to have been launched in the, in the 2000s, not 2021, more than a decade later. Um, we've overcome lots and lots of technical challenges and there have been, you know, hiccups and upsets and engineering and management, all you know, all sorts of things. Um, which perhaps could have been better. But on the other hand, we've been building an astonishing machine and, and technologies which just didn't exist at the beginning. So you could argue about how you would do this in the future, make sure you develop all the technologies or the key ones before you actually commit to building something rather than saying, we're going to build it. What do we have to do now? So, yeah, I, I don't think I've even internalised it yet. We've been involved for so long. I mean, I know so many people on the project have spent a great fraction of their careers. Uh, and I... 
to be quite honest, and it sounds like a strange thing to say, but I'm relatively peripheral in the sense that I put all of the work in at the beginning to make the science. I've been in the science working group all the way along. But of course, the people who've spent their real careers are the engineers and the technologists who've built this thing. Um, in industry, uh, Northrop Grumman and the prime contractors, Ball Aerospace uh, in the US, and then all of the people that built the instruments, the scientific instruments, have spent decades of their lives getting to this point. I've been lucky enough to do many other things at the same time as being involved in the project, um, keeping it going sort of at a, I don't know, a, a scientific level in my community, the star and planet formation community. But yeah, of course, you, as I said, right at the very beginning, before I got involved, I was just I just finished as a PhD student. And here I am, not that far away from retiring. I mean, that, that kind of says something about the cathedral that this mission is. Yeah, life's work. Wow. I mean, that's that's quite something. People forget that as well. I mean, the cost will be an issue. People always talk about how expensive these things are. And this project, broadly speaking, if you sum up the European contribution, Canadian contribution and the dominant US contribution, it's it's around $10 billion. Um, now, you can put that into scale. You can compare that to, you know, everybody's spa- favorite space entrepreneur who made $20 billion in a day recently when the Tesla stocks <laughs> went up. Um, you know, and this is amortized over more than 20 years, 30 years, 40 years when you include the operations. Um, and the European contribution, if you look at that, you can, you can look at it and say that's been the cost of one cheap cup of coffee in a cheap cafe for every person in Europe, total, over 20, more than 20 years. So I, I don't I never want to say that 10 billion isn't a lot. Of course, it's a colossal amount of money. And you will always the question, ask the questions, what could you spend it on otherwise? But if you look at what governments spend every year on all sorts of things, it's, it's been a very small amount. But again, the point to emphasise is it's not spent on buying expensive Lamborghinis and you know houses in Brazil. It's been spent on people. It's been spent on human beings that have spent decades of their life working, and, and 99.9% of them with no recognition externally. Nobody's done this to be famous. Um, nobody's going to make money out of it. And, and academics and engineers, you know, okay, I'm not saying they're badly paid, but they're not exactly making huge amounts of money either. So I think that's the important point, is that this is this is all being spent on people um, doing amazing things. And that's true of all space missions, almost 99.9% of the money, make, whatever the number is, is people. You can't just buy a telescope off the shelf and make somebody rich out of doing that. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and to, to me, like just knowing the return we got from Hubble and how inspirational that's been in terms of the next generation uh, and, and inspiring them, you know, that that's money well spent, you know, you, in schools, that's going to inspire kids to take up science and it's scientists of the future that are going to save the world. So that's really yeah. important. Yeah. Um, so mo- moving on, obviously we've got the launch this, this week, hopefully when this comes out. Uh, so tell us about the commissioning process after the launch, how long before it's likely to be fully operational? Yeah, I mean, that's everybody's saying, are you nervous about the launch? And I, to which I say, no, not really. Uh, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's not the nervous part. Um, of course it is. I mean, rockets can always have problems. Um, and, and, and we'll sort of be watching on for those eight minutes um, of the main powered launch phase. The key thing that happens first um, after that launch phase, and of course you have the two rocket, the, so, the solid rocket boosters on the side. This is an Ariane 5, of course, going French Guiana, one of Europe's contributions to the project. Um, so the main core engine, the two solid rockets, the, they, they, they peel away. So that's good. Get rid of them. Um, then the main engine cuts out. There's an upper stage. The fairing opens up, reveals um, web to the universe. That's an important point because one of the things that troubles us a little bit on the project, we think it's solved, um, is that there's air in the fairing, of course, when the telescope's being launched, and that air has to leak. Get You have to get rid of that air out into space. Now, you would say, well, you open the fairing, it all goes away. Well, if you do it all in one big go, there's a big pressure shock. And air, which may be trapped under the, um, the sun shield, because all this stuff is folded up, this 22-meter, this tennis court size sun shield is all folded up and so you've got if you've got air trapped under that and it all goes out explosively you could rip the the sun shield not a good not a good idea yeah so you got a skylab issue <laughs> yeah exactly so you know you don't want that to happen so we've had to engineer a special fairing uh, ariane spass and ruag in switzerland have made a special fairing 
that has vents on the side of it and those vents will actually let the air out uh, in advance so that when the fairing peels away into its two pieces that that depressurization uh, won't be won't be big so that's that's a phase that we're going to be watching um and then the, the first thing that happens automatically is that the solar panel comes out because at this point we're running on batteries and if we don't have um, power from the sun, the batteries run out and we have a dead observatory and that's not good. Um, so that's a critical thing that happens um, only um, half an hour, 20 minutes after launch. So that's got to happen. Um, but then everything after that gets a bit more sedate because everything that has to happen and there's a lot to happen uh, you need to be checking what's going on and say well that did that work yes that worked fine move on to the next step if it didn't what's plan b what's plan c and so there's a whole series of things that happen in the first 10 days or so uh, when we were going to be launching on the 18th of december this would have been finished on new year's day so now we're launching on the 22nd of december shift that by four days so we'll be in beginning of january when this phase happens so solar panel comes out then the sun shield has to start deploying. Uh, so you actually have to get the, the sun shields packaged up against the body of the telescope. Two pallets have to drop down by 90 degrees um, to put the sun shield at, at the horizontal. Uh, and then you've got two arms on the side of the observatory which pull the sun shield out bit by bit. And there's lots of deployment mechanisms which are holding the sun shield into the, the, these five layers of very thin film in place hundreds of actuators which all have to work in order to let the sun shield deploy motors pulleys it's actually more like a sail than anything else it's not a rigid structure it's very floppy uh, when it's being deployed um, and then the telescope itself actually has to detach from the body of the spacecraft or, or move up by two meters so that it creates a it, it's stacked hard against it during the launch for vibration reasons we want to move it up so it's almost th thermally decoupled from the hot side. So the sun shield unfurls, you've got a hot side facing the sun, the other side's cold, but you don't want conduction to take heat from one side to the other. Of course, it has to be connected, but you do it with very thin struts, so to speak. Um, then the wings of the primary mirror have to fold around. Actually, before that, the secondary mirror, which is packaged over the back, has to fold over the top in this kind of weird praying mantis type uh, movement. Uh, and then the, the wings of the, uh, the primary mirror have to deploy. The high gain antenna is deployed by this time so we can communicate with it. And there's one really interesting thing that has to uh, come out and everybody kind of looks at that. So what the heck's that for? At the back of the observatory, at the end of the, um, the sun shield, is a thing called the aft momentum flap or a trim tab. And that's basically a big flap that comes out and just sits there. And you say, well, why, why do I have one of those? And why is it at one end and not the other? Why is it not symmetric? This is actually a really fundamental part of, of, of James Webb. And it goes back to a, the way we operate the telescope. And, it, and this is there's a very significant difference to Hubble, which you mentioned before, had a very, has had a very long lifetime. So one of the things with a space telescope is that you've got, essentially, um, you've got, to point the telescope, you've got to say, I'm going to look at this star or this galaxy. And you use momentum wheels inside to move the telescope around. So what that basically means, you've got spinning wheels. And by changing the speed of the wheel, by breaking it or speeding it up, you can actually, just by the conservation of angular momentum, the telescope will go in the other direction, right? So if you spin the wheels a bit in one direction, the telescope has to go the other way. Uh, and then when you get to the point, then you, you leave the wheels where they are, the telescope stops, and then you lock on to the stars, which you want to use to guide the telescope. Now, that's all great. Uh, and you can do that continuously, move to this target, stop, move to that target, stop. But there is a slight issue, and that is that the center of mass of the telescope is not ever going to be exactly coincident with the center of light pressure coming from the sun. So you've probably heard of light sails, which use the, 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 the light from the sun to propel them through space. Well, we have a giant light sail. It's 22 meters in size. And if the center of pressure of that isn't along the same line as the center of mass, the telescope will tend to rotate just because of the light pressure. And that, you don't want that. So as the telescope is trying to rotate, you use the momentum wheels to keep it stable and go the other way. So you speed the wheels up, you speed the wheels up, you speed the wheels up. At some point, the wheels can't speed any faster. So you have to get rid of the excess momentum that's built up in the telescope. So how do you do that? 
Well, with Hubble, Hubble's really clever um, and, and can be because of where it is. Hubble's in the Earth's magnetic field. It's only about 500 kilometres above the Earth. And because it's in the Earth's magnetic field, you can turn an electric current on through some bars which are in the telescope and they connect to the magnetic field of the Earth. And if you turn the current on and off in the right sense, in the right direction, you can actually offload all that excess angular momentum into the Earth. You can just get rid of it, right? Which is brilliant. So that's why Hubble actually can continue, in a sense, forever, because it's not doing what we have to do with JWST so far away from the Earth, a million and a half kilometers away. We actually have to get rid of that angular momentum by using thrusters, by using propellant. So effectively, we fire the propellant in the opposite direction to the way the wheels are going or to the way the angular momentum's built up. As we fire the propellant, the observatory wants to go the other way. You can unload the wheels. You, you, you slow the wheels back down again. So that's the life limiter on Webb. How much propellant we have to offload this excess angular momentum. And that's what that trim tab's for at the back. The calculations have been made that you know where the center of mass and center of pressure are. We deploy this trim tab to be an, an extra little solar sail. And hopefully it's at just the right angle that that will offset that, that issue between the center of mass and the center of light. It will never be perfect, so we will have to use um, the, the propellant. But yeah, the, the level of details about what you need to do to make this kind of thing work is, is crazy. That is ridiculous. I had no idea about awesome. any of that. So it, you, you say that's life limiting. Um, how, how long are we talking? How, long, how much life do you think you're going to get out of, out of the telescope? And is there any contingency to be able to refuel? Yeah, so the, the requirement for the telescope is five years. So we always do that. We say, this is the minimum. It has to last this long. So you build everything for that. But you have a goal lifetime, and we, we will be carrying enough propellant for 10 years. We also need to use the propellant to adjust the orbit occasionally. So, you know, bringing all that together, we think it, uh, a 10-year lifetime is certainly reasonable. In fact, it's important that when Ariane Spass, uh, our launcher, launches it, the closer we can be on the right trajectory, the better, because that means we won't have to use propellant in the observatory to direct ourselves properly to L2. Um, so there's a lot of hope that we get the trajectory spot on, uh, that we can then save propellant for more scientific lifetime. But that's all built into the margins. Um, so yeah, 10 years is the, is the goal. And I, I just you know use that as a jumping off point, because if you come back to Hubble, why has Hubble been so successful? And you, you, you alluded to it. One, one thing which people forget is there's a human redemption story. We screwed up and then humans went back and fixed it. And that has, of course, had enormous resonance. Uh, astronauts going and rescuing this ailing observatory. Mm. But it's lifetime, 31 years to date, means that it has pictures from Hubble have been in textbooks, they've been on school walls, they've been in popular culture. They've been incredibly influential. Uh, generations have seen them and generations have you know, taught them to their kids. I think that you should never underestimate the power of kind of just you know, that, that long build up and you know it's still there and it's still doing it. Whereas 10 years, yeah, it's a long time. We'll get an enormous amount of science data, but whether it will have that sort of generational legacy remains to be seen. It's not clear to me that a 10 year mission will have the same impact as a 31 year in that popular culture way. And hopefully we mm. won't have the redemption story bit because hopefully we won't yeah. screw it up in the first place. <laughs> but yeah, the servicing part, so going back to refuel, there is a possibility of doing that, but it's not designed into the mission. There's no, you know, it's basically we haven't designed it out. We haven't made it impossible, right. uh, but it's not designed to be serviced. Um, certainly changing the instruments and so on, forget that. The, 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 the Hubble was all very compartmentalized. You could pull boxes out and put boxes in. JWST is not built that way at all. Uh, it's all incredibly packaged and wired up and, you know, you, you can't remove a module. Astronauts won't be able to do that part. And uh, I don't know how it all worked out, but apparently it did somehow. <laughs> but there was things, I don't know what was going right. You know, I remember in the beginning, nothing fit. We got that stuff, they got geniuses figuring stuff out to like the nanometer, right? Or whatever, you know, the spot. And it's still not fitting. We're both trying stuff. I don't know what's going on out there, but somehow I think it all worked. So, um, unlike Hubble, uh, which observes in the near ultraviolet, visible, and near infrared spectra, the James Webb Space Telescope will observe in a lower uh, frequency range from long wavelength visible light. 
through mid infrared, which will allow it to observe high red shift objects that Hubble can't observe. So what, in your opinion, would be like a moon landing if James Webb observed and, and discovered it? <laughs> well, a little bit like Hubble, really. I mean, some of the greatest discoveries of Hubble were not designed in from the beginning. They were found afterwards. So almost by definition, I can't tell you what those will be <laughs> yet. I mean, the, the core science goals, there's essentially four um, main science themes for Hubble. The first one is those high redshift galaxies, those very first objects that formed in the universe. Um, and, and it's important that they're, um, they're not just the same as galaxies today. The material in the universe when it was very young, 13.8 billion years ago, um, was different. There was mostly only hydrogen and helium. All of what we call the, the metals, astronomers are weird, we call anything that's not hydrogen or helium a metal, um, just because we're lazy, I think. But um, <laughs> So oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, all of those things which are important parts of, and silicon, p- important parts of the Earth, right? The rocks we have, the life that we are, they didn't exist in, in the early universe. So those first galaxies will be different, but understanding how they were born, how they formed, uh, is critical to understanding about galaxy evolution that occurred since then. And that's another big theme. How do galaxies, how have they changed over cosmic time? Many of the objects we see in pictures like the Hubble Deep Field picture, they're not there anymore, or they're certainly not the way that they look in those images. Um, and there's this sort of weird idea, everybody's familiar with this idea, that when we look at the, the sun, it's eight, mil- eight minutes in the past. When we look at uh, the nearest star, it's four years in the past. But we kind of assume that the sun is still there eight minutes later and that Proxima Centauri is still there, even though it's four years ago. But those galaxies are billions of years ago. They, they don't look the same today at all. So, so this idea of galaxy evolution is really important. Then you come into our own Milky Way galaxy and you start saying, well, what does, you know, how do stars form and how do planets form around them? And one of the key things and why I got involved is that the infrared is the right place to do that. When, when young stars are being born, they're surrounded by the gas and dust they're made out of. And the dust in particular absorbs visible light. You see dark clouds and you, you may know there's something inside, but you can't see it invisible. The infrared lets you go straight through the dust, uh, uh, penetrate the dust uh, like night vision camera, and see the young stars, see the disks of swirling material, the, the, the gas and dust that actually is going to make planets. Maybe in some cases we even see protoplanets in those disks. We can also look at the chemistry. What's going on in that disk? Where's the water? Where are the molecules? Where, how are they collecting? And that's another big thing for, for James Webb is looking at the planet formation process. Um, and when you look at long wavelengths, you, you can actually see the dust emitting as well. So when it, the dust gets warmed up by its proximity to a protostar, you can actually see warm emission. And so you can do lots more in the infrared. And then the thing which is sort of new, um, relatively, for JWST is exoplanets. So they weren't known about. The first one was discovered in 1995. Webb was already on its way in some sense by then. But it turns out it's a very powerful machine for doing spectroscopy, uh, analyzing the atmospheres, the, the chemistry of the atmospheres of planets going around other stars. And the way you do that is this so-called transit technique. When a, a, star, a, a planet passes in front of the star, a little bit of the starlight is absorbed by that planet as it goes in front, tiny fraction. But if a planet has an atmosphere, the amount of light that's absorbed is slightly different at different wavelengths because certain molecules and certain atoms absorb light better than others. And so you actually can create a spectrum out of how the light changes. And, you know, great goal there would be to see if there are any planets which have habitable atmospheres, not necessarily finding life, but planets that could support life, what we call non-equilibrium chemistry that we have in our own atmosphere. Now, that's a kind of a, it's a goal. It, it's going to be difficult. It's not, it was never designed for that. It's capable of it. It would take a huge amount of time, but you can be sure we will be spending a lot of time with JWST looking at, at exoplanets. And then planets in our own solar system. Um, there's lots to do. We, can, we can't look at Venus and Mercury. Uh, we can't look at the Earth. Um, we can't look back into the solar system towards the sun because of this need to keep the sun on one side of the sun shield. But we can look at Mars, we can look at Jupiter, we can look at Saturn, and we can look out even to the Kuiper belt, all those weird and wonderful objects out there. So that was something that was introduced in a telescope to what's called uh, non-sidereal tracking. So tracking objects which are not stars, moving against the star background. You might think, well, that's easy. Well, it isn't really, because you have to have the telescope has to be guiding on stars. And if your planet's moving relative to those stars, 
you have to be able to move the guider uh, in order to be able to do that. So that's a great additional thing which we'll do. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. With Hubble, some of the things which were big, big uh, stories there, like the distance scale, figuring out how big the universe is, Hubble certainly played an important role there, but then lots of ground-based observations did as well. And I think if you ask the general public today, they would say, no, the, the deep fields are prob- and, and maybe the pillars of creation, uh, the Eagle Nebula, those star formation crossed over with these first galaxies. And they weren't really the things that Hubble was designed to do in either case. I can't wait to see what this discovers. I've been excited about this for ages. <laughs> Talking about being excited... Is there something about the telescope which excites you, which you may not have mentioned already, uh, which you may think is being missed by the media or the space community in their conversations about this? Wow, that's a good question. I mean, it's kind of that weird proximity effect. I'm right up against it and uh, (laughs) trying to think about what people are saying. Of course, the thing that people focus on uh, a lot is pictures uh, and people saying, are we going to see the same pictures, the same kind of beauty as we see from Hubble? It's an interesting question because implicit in what they're saying is, oh, this isn't a visible telescope. I won't, you know, you're going to be showing me things that aren't real because if I can't see it, it's not real. I mean, because it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. But you have to remember that Hubble itself very often photographs things in ways that human, the human eye would never see them anyway uh, by using emission line filters. I mean, again, pillars of creation, M16, those elephant trunks. That initial picture is all very green and blue. It looks like um, seaweed, you know, uh, under the ocean. Very resonant because of that, but it's nothing like what it would look like. Um, If if the human eye was sensitive enough to see it, um, it would be red. Uh, It's dominated by the hydrogen line, hydrogen alpha. And so the infrared images we're going to be taking with Hubble will have the same quality. They will be, the the colours will be meaningful. The colours will tell us about the physics and the science of what we're seeing. And something that's red will be redder than something that's blue, but in infrared terms, not visible terms. So these won't be false colours at all. They just won't be things that humans could see. So actually, one thing that excites me in that sense is that we are loaded, but loaded with filters. We have all sorts of different wavelengths that we can isolate to look for particular features, particular molecules, particular emission lines. And that means that we will be able to take spectacular pictures because the more different filters you can combine, uh, the more beautiful it will be and scientifically meaningful. I don't, again, I want to emphasize not false. Just like Instagram. Well, a little bit. I mean, you know, and uh, (laughs) we we will make them look as beautiful. It's been a big part of my scientific career is being taken infrared images from the ground and and making... um, scientifically meaningful but beautiful images and I you know I don't one shouldn't demean that that's important but to answer your question what people do forget a lot is spectroscopy Uh, this is a really powerful spectrograph for breaking the light into wavelengths and doing physics and chemistry uh, essentially and there are four instruments on um, JWST there's the near cam the near infrared camera uh, which is the main workhorse imaging instrument Uh, with all of these amazing filters is also a really important instrument because it helps us align the telescope remember those 18 hexagonal segments we talked about at the beginning they all have to be lined up to nanometer accuracy uh, which means we have to push and pull them relative to each other rotate them tilt them and actually we can we can bend them slightly by pulling on the back of them to give them a slightly different radius of curvature and those all have to be lined up precisely as if they were one perfect mirror so that's a big part of that six-month commissioning phase that we uh, we kind of talked about the first few days. But after the first few days, we have to let the telescope get cold. We have to turn the instruments on. We have to align the mirrors. We have to get all the instruments checked out. So it's a six-month period to answer that earlier question. We won't really be starting to do science until uh, summer 2022. Um, so it's a long, long wait. Lots of work going on, but... Um, uh, it's going to be, you know, a little bit frustrating for people who expect to see beautiful pictures on the first day. Not going to happen. But yeah, the, the four instruments. So near cam is really important for imaging, but also for that wave, what we call wavefront sensing, aligning the telescope. Uh, and then we have another imager, which is coming from Canada, um, which is actually part of the fine guidance sensor, uh, the fine guidance system, which allows us to track objects really precisely but it also will allow you to do imaging and spectroscopy, and that means spreading the light out. But the other two instruments are a full-on spectrograph from Europe um, called NearSpec, which is super clever because it allows you 
to not just take the spectrum of one object, but up to hundreds of objects simultaneously with a little gizmo in the focal plane in where the light comes in, which allows you to open little shutter doors and say, I want to see a spectrum of that p- part of the sky, but I don't want all of the rest of the sky around it. And by um, electronically controlling these little shutters, of which we have quarter of a million, you can actually open the doors in just the right places on just the right galaxies and get hundreds of objects spectra simultaneously. And then the, f- the fourth instrument is the mid-infrared. So those are all near-infrared instruments out to about five microns. Uh, and the other one is the mid-infrared instrument, which is fantastically complicated and capable, an imager and a spectrograph. And this weird thing we call in- integral field uh, spectroscopy. Where effectively, you take a picture of a piece of the sky, uh, you slice it up into pieces uh, horizontally. Each one of those slices goes into a spectrograph and then gets broken into a spectrum Um, And then you can reconstruct it where you have an image, um, 2D, but for every wavelength you have a slice in that image, you have a cube, and you can just roll through that that cube and see a galaxy or a planet or or whatever object you're looking at in all those different wavelengths. And we have some animations online which show how that works, and if if your mind is not completely scrambled by the end of looking at those (laughs) videos, uh, you're a better person than me, because I look at it, I even know how it works, and I think, how did anybody design that? But yeah, very (laughs) clever instrument. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned that you're creating images from these infrared data. You know, it sounds like an art project to me. Um, and while we have you here, it feels rude not to ask you about what you do with uh, with Space Rock. So just briefly, how, how did that get started? And uh, is there anything, any events planned and, or anything coming up with that that we need to know about? Yeah, so the origin of Space Rocks actually goes back to, I said earlier on, one of the things, I've been lucky enough to work on many other things along the way. So I, I joined ESA in 2009 uh, I'd been working in the scientific community uh, on instrumentation, imaging, came to ESA in 2009. And JWST was one of many missions that I had effectively around me. And I was responsible for communications and outreach for a number of years. And one of the missions which fell right into the middle of that was Rosetta. Um, and of course, you know, somebody asked me yesterday, another interview I was doing, you know, what do you think one of the biggest successes of ESA is? And I think I'm very biased maybe, but it's Rosetta. I mean, that mission to a comet, landing a small lander on the surface, then orbiting the comet for two years, seeing it change, really resonated, I think, with the public scientifically and technically that it was it was possible to do something like that. But we also did a lot of interesting outreach, uh, including uh, cartoons for kids, which tried to illustrate the science, the journey, the individual steps. We made a couple of, uh, we made a science fiction film, which was in three pieces uh, called Ambition, um, short science fiction film set in the deep future um, starring Aidan Gillen from Game of Thrones and Ashling Franciosi who I like to think got a, a role in Game of Thrones because she was in our film but uh, she, she was in that later on and, and music was a huge part uh, we worked with lots of musicians um, we were lucky enough to have a connection to Vangelis who was the soundtrack composer for Chariots of Fire and Blade Runner and he wrote an entire album of music about Rosetta. Uh, he, gave, he gave us four tracks for free at the time of the landing, which is remarkable. Uh, he's been a good friend uh, over the years. But we worked with lots of other musicians. And um, through Matt Taylor, who was the project scientist for Rosetta at the time, we met a guy called Alex Milas in London, who was the editor of, or at that point, the chief executive um, of a, a bunch of people called Team Rock, who publish uh, progressive rock magazine, classic rock, heavy metal, uh, metal hammer. Um, And Alex is a big space buff. Uh, uh, He's an archaeologist by training before he became a heavy metal uh, music journalist. And he said, we want to do something. We want to get together. This has to be something we can do. And I've been a big fan of music forever, love music. Um, And we thought, well, let's invent something. So that's what Space Rocks is. And, And Space Rocks brings together astronauts, scientists, engineers, uh, people from the space world, together with musicians and artists, uh, actors, poets, uh, sculptors, you name it. We've got all sorts of people involved. And I know something that interests you greatly, of course, as a musician. Mm -hmm. We've done gigs. We've done two big uh, day-long events at the O2 uh, in in London. Uh, We've also been to festivals. We've been here to where I work in the Netherlands, Eztec. Of course, the pandemic got in the way of all of that. So that, that was in 2018, 2019. And since then, we've been doing something similar to what you're doing. We've been doing a live stream 
called Uplink, uh, welcoming all the same people in for a chat just like this. We've had all sorts. Vangelis has been in there, Stephen Wilson, Charlotte Hatherley, Katie Tunstall. We've got we've had um, Katie Sackoff uh, from Battlestar Galactica. We've had uh, Shoray Agdeshlu from The Expanse. We even had um, Anthony Daniels, R2, um, R2-D2, C-3PO. So, yeah, and Jason Isaacs from uh, the Harry Potter nice. films, but also and he's been a great friend. He's done lots of things with Hello, us. Hello, Jason Isaacs. Um, so, yeah, it's been brilliant. And I think it's something I believe passionately in is that that crossover between science and art isn't just for entertainment. It's not just because it's kind of cool. And I like to be on stage with musicians and they like to hang around with astronauts. But because I think that's a way of reaching people, uh, of, of communicating ideas and sharing cultural perspectives that you can't do from one community or the other. Um, and we just... In the same regard, we've just uh, welcomed a new artist in residency to ESA today who's going to be working with us over the next few months. I think this is a really important thing. Uh, and I, I know from your, you know, what you you guys do, it's uh, something you believe in as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully now with, a, well, we'll see, an Omicron variant notwithstanding, um, we certainly would like to go back out live next year. And of course, with the European Space Agency, we're, we're not just interested in doing events in the UK. We've been talking to people in Poland, in Spain, in France, in Germany um, to put on these, uh, these, these festivals, if you like. And there's a lot of interest in it. So hopefully doubly so now that we, you know, people have really been stuck at home for so long. Yeah. Let, let's see how that goes. But yeah, it's, uh, people, welcome to all of our Uplink episodes are on YouTube. Uh, they can all be watched for free, no problem at all. Um, there's about... 62 episodes we've done by now with lots and lots of interesting people fantastic well mark thank you so much for your time this has been really wonderful really appreciate you 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 breaking down the mission to us like that teaching us so much yeah. about it uh, and giving us your expertise because uh, i've learned a lot about what's going on there which i had no idea about so thank you very much i'm sure oh. a lot of people will uh, be grateful for that my my pleasure and of course that's just part one right we get to do the rest of the mission for the next you know episodes three four five you know two three four i'm kidding but there's a lot no. to, there's a lot more to understand about how, uh, jwst episodes but. yeah twenty four thousand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well partic- particularly when we get results as well i think that'll be you know people uh, i think that's an important time to come back in because some of the results will be immediately obvious bang there's a picture and some won't and and some will need a bit of interpretation and some will need a bit of you know what are we seeing here uh why is that exciting um, and I'm really looking forward to that moment, maybe just six months away now. Well, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to talk to you in six months then. Yeah, um, my pleasure. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks very much. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Okay, that was mind-blowing. There was so much I learned that I had no earthly idea about. And um, I, I'm embarrassed to admit this. I It's like I almost forgot they were sending it to L2 because I'm like, well, why does it have to be kept cold? And then I was like, never mind, never mind, never mind. They're sending yeah. it to L2, of course. There's no, there's going to be, they and they want it away from the sun. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I thought I knew about this. I thought I'd read things about it, and so it, it, it either not sunk in, or I just my brain's got too much things going on at the moment because everything he said, I seem to be like, oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, that, I didn't know that. That makes yeah. He would be he would say stuff, and a light would go on and be like, oh, oh, that makes sense. But there's an incredible artifact. I. I I hope it's still on his Twitter. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Mc, uh, McDowell on Twitter released it. And it's a booklet released in 1989 about the next generation space telescope, which is sort of the idea for where Webb came from. And somebody put up the PDF for it. And uh, no way. And I, I put the PDF on Space Hipsters and I, I cited uh, Dr. McDowell for it. But I, I would go read that. It's so cool because they have sort of like artist concepts of what we think the next generation space telescope should be. And they look remarkably similar to what the James Webb looks like. So it, it's really cool to, you know, to think, wow, they've been planning this forever. Yeah. Uh, I'm now, I'm now hunting down that tweet and I'll put it in the show notes if I can find it. But yeah, what, what a great guest. What I loved is that he made it all accessible to me. Yeah. I understood what he was talking about which I thought was really useful. Yeah, the same. I, I, I love astronomy. I, I am not a professional astronomer. I, I really know very little about it. So the way he explained it made it seem very uh, understandable to somebody like me who has 
kind of a very rudimentary <laughs> background, didn't it? I know the difference between, you know, I some, you know, Spectra, but that's about it. So he made it make a lot of sense for me. And I can't wait. I know it's going to be a few months, obviously, but I can't wait for those first pictures. Oh, my gosh. That's going to be awesome. I know. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I'll put links to his social media in the show notes. And don't forget, as always, the video will be on our Patreon page unedited. And, it, and we talked about a lot. We talked about a hell of a lot there. Discovery Houston. 20 seconds to LOS Tedris. And so, no news this week because of me being away. But we hope you enjoyed this episode and that it's got you excited for the pending launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, we'll be back next week to catch up on the news and all that. In the meantime, please consider hitting the share button so we can try and reach some of your space flight loving friends. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.